Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are going to wait a few moments and allow people time to log on and join us. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. All right, I think we are officially going to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Elephants, Climate Smart Agriculture and Raptor Monitoring in Kenya with Matthew Bowers, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Spring 2022 Conservation Science Trainee and graduate student with Western Kentucky University. Welcome Matthew. Thank you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending my talk today. Thanks, Matt. My name is Jamie Dawson, and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education, locally and globally. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. So to all of our members out there, thank you, muchas gracias, merci beaucoup for all of your support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, well, we like you anyway, and we're glad you're here and we hope you consider becoming a member in the future. Um, Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone's having a fantastic year at the start of 2024. And we are thrilled to have the opportunity to offer free virtual programming to our local and global communities. But as always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded and the video will be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website that directly connects you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers can submit their questions through the Q&A platform on Zoom and we'll have time at the end of the program to take questions. Um, and I'm just so excited that Matt is here with us to share with us his adventures in Kenya doing research. I can't wait. Um, but before we go further, I'd like to take a moment to share some of Matt's background experience with our audience. Matt Bowers is currently a graduate student at Western Kentucky University, working towards a master's degree in biology. Born and raised in Reading, Pennsylvania, Matt earned his bachelor's degree at Penn State University in 2021, where he majored in wildlife and fisheries science and minored in international agriculture. After graduating, he spent a summer as an American Kestrel research technician for Hawk Mountain before becoming a Hawk Mountain trainee in the spring of 2022. His master's research, which he will be discussing today, led him back to East Africa, where he studied abroad back in 2019. Matt plans on defending his thesis and graduating this summer. And he is currently looking for opportunities where he can continue to do wildlife research and outreach as a career. Some pretty amazing experiences you have had, Matt. I am envious. Um, so I have to ask you, what inspired you to study the field of wildlife science and agriculture? Yeah, so I was very outdoorsy as a kid. I loved exploring in the woods behind my house. And as I got older, I got involved in Boy Scouts, which um, kind of solidified my passion for the outdoors and nature. But really when it comes to wildlife, um, I got inspired primarily by media. I would watch people like Jack Hanna and Steve Irwin or any film that was narrated by David Attenborough. And that really gave me you know, passion and um, interest in animals, in wildlife conservation, and um, I wanted to be just like them. As far as the agriculture side of things, um, it's in more of a roundabout way. I do not have a farming background at all. Um, but when I studied abroad in Tanzania and Kenya, I learned a lot about the agricultural communities there and the conflicts that they have with wildlife. And when I came back to Penn State, my advisor told me that I needed to take two classes and I could have a minor in international agriculture, which at the time I'm like, sure, I'll take two classes and get the minor. But um, when I actually took the classes, I really enjoyed them. It was something that I gained a, a new passion for and it set me up well um, in getting this current position that I have at Western Kentucky. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that. So can you share with us how you first became involved in Hawk Mountain? 
yeah. So when uh, I was graduating in 2021, I was looking for technician jobs to build upon my experience. I knew I wanted to take a gap year in between my undergrad and my graduate degree. And so I was just looking to kind of diversify my skill set. And when I was looking for jobs, I came across a posting um, for a, an American Kestrel technician position in central Pennsylvania um, in Center County, um, where I was currently at. Um, that's where Penn State University is at. And I saw that it was through Hawk Mountain, which I had visited Hawk Mountain a few times as a kid. I wasn't too familiar um, with Hawk Mountain, but I, I knew who they were. And I'm like, sure, why not? I'll apply for this. It was also logistically good because I was able to keep my apartment that I was currently at, um, at Penn State. Um, and so I interviewed with Hawk Mountain's own JF Therian and um, Allison Cornell from Penn State Altoona. And I got the job and kind of the rest is history. I loved that job. I'd never had experience with birds, but um, much less raptors, but I loved it. And I, you know, came back to become a trainee for Hawk Mountain the following spring. So definitely worth it. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. So what experiences during your time at Hawk Mountain help you the most or do you use the most with your current work? Yeah. So um, while the field work that I did at Hawk Mountain was super cool and interesting and I built those skills, it didn't quite apply to what I'm doing now at grad school. I think the thing that um, the experience that has benefited me the most was when I was a trainee at Hawk Mountain, I had the opportunity um, kind of on the side to work on a paper to publish. And so I, um, with one of the other trainees, uh, Pauli, and then help from JF and Becca at Hawk Mountain, I went through the, we went through the American Kestrel um, database that Hawk Mountain has going all the way back to the 50s, analyzed those data. And I was, they were able to help guide me in writing my first scientific paper, which recently got published. And now that I'm working on my thesis and writing that, all those skills that I gained with scientific writing have, you know, carried directly over to what I'm doing now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I'm ready, Matt. Take me to Kenya. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to hear your presentation. I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Let's do it. I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you do not get it. And all right. Is that Let's okay, start. Jamie? All right. Let me just adjust my screen a little bit here. All right. So again, thank you all for attending my talk. Today, I will be discussing elephants, climate smart agriculture, and raptor monitoring in Kenya. And on the surface, you might look at these three topics and think that they're not really related. They're all kind of unique. But hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand and see that they are very much interconnected. So my background, I'm going to kind of fly through this slide just because Jamie already covered it a bit. But I did my undergrad at Penn State. Um, during that time, I studied abroad for a semester in Tanzania and Kenya with a program called School for Field Studies. And if you can't tell, that kind of inspired me to want to come back and do research in that area for my master's degree. And then went on to Hawk Mountain, where I was a technician studying American kestrels, which are the smallest falcon species in North America, uh, before coming a trainee. And so that's my trainee class here in the bottom right. And now currently I'm working on my master's degree at Western Kentucky University. So for my master's thesis, the project that I joined is called Elephants and Sustainable Agriculture in Kenya, or ESAC. Uh, this is a collaboration between my university, a company called Wildlife Works. They lead an REDD Plus project. If you're not familiar with that, REDD Plus stands for Reducing Emissions Through Deforestation and Forest Degradation. And so what they're involved with is selling carbon credits, if you've ever heard of that. Um, if not, I encourage you to look into it. Essentially what they do is um, they preserve habitat, um, preserve trees, which in essence are carbon that um, various companies can then purchase to offset their emissions. So you can look into them. And then another partner is Earthwatch Institute. I cannot say enough good things about Earthwatch. They are an organization that organizes citizen science expeditions. And so you check out their website, they have expeditions throughout the world. And essentially if you sign up for one of those, you then um, become an assistant for a real life scientist and you go in the field, you help collect real data um, and see what scientists are doing hands-on. And so, um, as part of my time in Kenya, I helped lead Earthwatch teams 
And I know some of the volunteers are here on this talk right now, which makes me very happy. Um, so definitely check out Earthwatch if you've never heard of them. Going back to ESAC, I want to start by saying that the overarching goal of the project is human elephant coexistence. And this will make more sense the more that I talk throughout this presentation. But um, essentially, in the area that I was at in Kenya and in a lot of places in sub Saharan Africa, um, you have instances where people, primarily in rural areas, and elephants and other wildlife um, are in conflict. And so trying to mitigate that is what this project is all about. I listed the objectives there more for reference. I'm gonna be covering these as I talk, but um, just know that the main things that we're shooting for are to mitigate these conflicts that I just mentioned, tie in climate change into all of this and see um, agricultural techniques that can be resilient to climate change, looking at how elephants modify habitat, also just knowing identification of elephants because that can tell you um, a lot about behavior and you can see which elephants might be more likely to um, be involved in a conflict. And then finally, education and community outreach, which is a valuable part of any uh, research program. So to set the stage for my specific research, I first want to introduce two major parties and threats to those parties, one being Kenyan farmers, the other one being elephants. So major threats to Kenyan farmers, um, the first one being climate change, where I was at in southeastern Kenya, it's already a very, very arid area, and that is only getting worse with climate change. There's been a lot of droughts. Um, in fact, in 2021 and 2022, um, so over those two years, there's four growing seasons. They have two seasons a year where they can grow crops. Um, I don't believe any of those four growing seasons had any harvest because of droughts. There was just not enough water to grow anything. Um, and as you can see there on the slide, most of the agriculture is rain fed. Um, what that means is that there's no irrigation, um, partly due to there's just not enough resources or infrastructure or money for it. Um, and partially just because there's there's not enough water in these regions. And so most farmers in these smallholder farming communities, um, they just rely on rain. And if there's not enough rain, they don't have crops. The second major threat is wildlife that consume their crops, um, primarily elephants. I know that photo is not an elephant. This photo here is actually called an eland. Um, they're really massive. They're like bigger than a cow. Um, I just put that there because it's, it's a good illustration of wildlife consuming crops. Um, but essentially, uh, the, the, the interaction between people and wildlife is a lot different in Kenya. They're a lot more exposed to wildlife than, say, people here in the U.S. Um, these rural farmers are often right next to wildlife sanctuaries where they're not fenced. I mean, wildlife can just come and go as they please into their farm fields. Um, and so that's a major concern. I, I noted elephants because they, um, just by volume, cause the most damage. You could have a small antelope that comes into a field and it might eat like five plants and go on its way. If you have an elephant that comes into a field, it could literally destroy a farmer's entire crop in one night. Um, so they are just, they, they cause a lot of damage. Going to the elephant side of things now, um, the first and really the major threat is people. Uh, poaching, I'm sure you're all familiar with poaching for ivory, um, which has been going on for forever. Um, and it has been getting better. Uh, in Kenya, especially recently, but it still does exist. And then retaliation events. So talking about farmers again, a lot of farmers, if an elephant is coming into their field, they want to protect that. That's their livelihoods. That's their income. And so they will try to injure or kill elephants. Um, and that's a, a pretty common thing. The next major threat being habitat loss. This also ties into people because we are to blame for that. But if you look at that image here, um, in the bottom right, the bluish green area, that's the historical range, or you can picture it more as like viable habitat um, historically for elephants. And the red is where elephants currently can be found throughout Africa. So you're just tightening where they can live. You're limiting the amount of food and resources, and it's just going to impact their population. Now, three out of these four things that I talked about are direct instances of human elephant conflict. Um, which is just as the name implies, it's conflict between people and elephants. And so um, before I go on to the, the slide for this next one, um, when I was preparing for this presentation, or as I was preparing for it, I was also watching the new planet Earth 3, which recently came out. And 
you know, just watching it for fun. But then in one of the episodes, they start talking about human elephant conflict in Kenya. And I'm like, hey, that is literally my thesis. Uh, and so I encourage you to check out that episode. I'm, of course, not going to play all of it, but I do have a little 30 second snippet here that I think highlights um, this close interaction between people and elephants that puts lives at risk, both human lives and elephant lives. And so this little snippet here, hopefully the volume works. If not, it's just, you can see it, it's it's a 30 second snippet, but um, it's showing rangers that are trying to keep elephants out of this village and they're doing so using firecrackers. So let's see if this works. Rangers have to resort. Driven from this field. So again, just a, I wanted to have a visual element for you guys to see what human elephant conflict can look like. And later on in this video, David Attenborough talks about how, uh, and I'll quote from him, he says, each year human elephant conflict takes the lives of up to 200 elephants and 20 people in Kenya alone. Now that's just Kenya. Um, and as you know, there's elephants throughout more than just Kenya. So um, this conflict is serious, and it does put lives at risk. Well, why is this serious? I already talked a little bit about that just now, but um, just looking at a, a big picture view here, let's start with the role of agriculture in Kenya, which is massive. Um, agriculture is a third of the country's GDP, and it employs 40% of the population, specifically 70% of the rural population. Um, that's a lot. In comparison, the U.S., uh, it's about 10% employment in the agricultural sector in one way or another. And so a lot of lives and livelihoods are impacted by threats to the agricultural system. Climate change is going to intensify. There, that, that's no secret. Um, there's a lot of data that show that. And so in these regions where droughts are becoming more and more common, you're going to have um, more and more threats to food security and food insecurity has direct correlations to poverty. And so you bring in all these different socioeconomic um, components, um, consequences, if you will, um, of the conflict and of climate change. Human population growth is a massive factor as well. For those that don't know, Africa is the continent that has the fastest growing human population. The growth rate is highest um, in Africa compared to all other continents. And so, um, the more people that you have on the planet, that's more mouths that you need to feed, which means that's more food that you need to grow. And so what happens if you need to grow more food? Often that means that you're taking away habitat from wildlife. The conflict is going to continue. I love this graph here. This is from FAO stat, and they're scaled differently um, just to line up, which is why I don't have the y-axis. But um, in red here, this is human population over time in Kenya. And in blue, that is the production of maize or corn. Um, in US, we're the weird ones that call it corn. Everyone else calls it maize. So I will use those two terms interchangeably. Um, but this is looking at total maize production over time. And you can see on this graph that they mostly line up. As the human population increases, so does the amount of corn that is being um, produced. But if you now look at this graph as maize grown per unit area, so how efficiently you're growing the corn, this is what you get. And so this blue line has now been declining since the 80s. And so what that means essentially is the only reason that this curve is possible, that we're able to meet the demands of a growing population is not because we can grow food better using the existing amount of land, it's because we're taking more land to grow crops, which is then directly impacting habitat and wildlife populations. So very serious issue. And then tying in elephants to all of this as well. Um, elephants are a keystone species. What that means is that they just play a vital role in the ecosystem and they can affect many different um, species, uh, additional species of wildlife. I'm gonna go over the term ecosystem engineers a little bit later on, um, but just know that they're very valuable to have around and they're also an endangered species now. They recently got listed by the IUCN as endangered. So it's critical that we conserve them and their populations. 
So we talked about the problems, the threats to these two things, um, the human elephant conflict and climate change. Well, now let's look at potential solutions. For human elephant conflict, we have deterrent fences. And so deterrent fences are nice because they eliminate that um, what has existed historically where people are coming up in close contact with elephants, like you saw in that video, and they're throwing firecrackers, they have fire, and they're trying to chase them out. That's where you get a lot of those um, deaths. And so deterrent fences eliminate the people from the equation. And um, there's a lot of different techniques. You could have ones like electric fences that work very well, but they're also not very affordable to most Kenyans. The two pictures that I have here, and I hope that, at least on my screen, my image of me is blocking the pictures. Hopefully it's not for you all. But um, in the top right, you have, these are called beehive fences. And so they are beehives that are um, strung along a line. Um, at least some of them are active. And how they work is an elephant comes up to the fence line, they hit the line, which shakes the hives, the bees get aggravated, they go after the elephants, and elephants do not like bees. The other one you have here, this is a chili pepper fence that this man is um, setting up. And this involves taking cloth and soaking it in um, typically used motor oil um, that also contains uh, chili peppers and has all the you know capsaicin in it so that as elephants approach the fence um, you know olfactory wise like it burns and they don't want to come any closer to the field and now there's trade-offs to both of these um, are they a little bit more affordable for communities than like an electric fence or a concrete wall absolutely um, the beehive fence it only works if you have bees and in places where you can have bees it's you know shown to be very effective but in the study area where I'm at, it's very dry. Um, if you don't have water, you don't have flowers. If you don't have flowers, you don't have bees. So that fence doesn't really work very well. Um, as far as the chili pepper fence, you have some environmental concerns. Uh, number one being, I mean, you don't want used motor oil um, just dripping onto your uh, crops or to the vegetation that's there. So again, trade-offs. For climate change, a solution is climate smart agriculture. This is a conceptual framework that has three main pillars and I have them in this figure here. So first one is essentially improving yields, improving productivity of the crop. Second is building resilience to climate change. So essentially having techniques or crops or whatever that can withstand, let's say the droughts in this particular region. And then number three is just reducing agriculture's impact on climate change. So you don't want to introduce any techniques that are going to increase emissions or that are going to result in you dumping gallons of pesticides on your field. So those are the three main pillars. It's just a, a concept for a variety of techniques that are trying to build climate resilience. And so you have these two solutions, but what about the relationship between them? Solutions for human elephant conflict might not align with solutions for climate smart agriculture. And that's where my research comes in because this topic is understudied. I'm trying to see, you know, let's say you have an elephant deterrent fence that works well, but now instead of just growing corn, you're growing, you're doing a different uh, climate smart technique. Well, maybe that influences elephant behavior. Maybe they like one crop over the other. Um, we don't know. That's why you want to study it. Uh, and I also have here, you want to emphasize practices that are affordable, practical, and effective. I already highlight, highlighted that a bit, but just to emphasize, the average farmer in Kenya um, makes around the equivalent of two U.S. dollars per day. Um, now, granted, that two U.S. dollars does go a little bit further in Kenya than it does here, but it's still not a lot of money at all. And then tie into the fact that, especially in these rural communities, um, most families are very large. I, uh, I'd say the average family has, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten kids. It's a lot of kids. I know one farmer, well, I don't know, but I, um, one of my research friends in Kenya told me how there's a family in a town called Mackinac Road where um, I believe there's a man. And so polygamy is common in a lot of tribes in Kenya. And so this man has three wives and I think each wife has between eight to 12 kids. So it's a household of like 30 kids. That's a lot of mouths to feed. And if you don't not making a lot of money, well, um, and you have feeding your kids, paying your kids school fees versus putting up an electric fence around your um, crop field, well, you know where the priorities go. And so we really want to emphasize solutions that are affordable, especially affordable and practical for these farmers. 
A big reason why international aid fails is that you have these groups that come in, they have funding, labor, resources, whatever, they come in and they have this goal in mind and it typically works really great while they're there, but that organization or those people, the income is not going to stay forever and eventually they leave. And what happens when they leave? Well, typically all that hard work that you did ends because those farmers can't sustain themselves afterwards. So you want, um, the big thing that ESAC and me personally am passionate about is you wanna find solutions that can be sustainable once any you know outside research or aid leaves. All right, so let's get into my research. Again, I'm breaking these up into the two components, agriculture and the elephant conflict. So to assess climate smart agriculture, my main research question is what factors influence crop growth and development? Um, what leads to variation that allows crops to grow the best? And so there's a lot of variables you can look at, soil, conditions, the technique being used, et cetera. I'll talk about all those in a bit. And so I had two main experiments for that, zypits and intercropping, which I'll explain shortly. For assessing human elephant conflict mitigation, my main question is, is a successful elephant deterrent fence just as successful in a climate smart agricultural system? I already mentioned that. If you change what you're growing or how you're growing it, does that influence elephant behavior at these fences? And for that, we primarily use camera traps that we have stationed at the fields and we look at approaches versus breaches to determine the success of a fence. So if an elephant comes up to this fence line and you can see on the camera trap that they come up to it and then they go away, well, that's an approach. But if they come up to it and then breach the fence line and go into the field, that's a breach. And you can you know, ratio those two numbers to determine the success rate of your field or of your fence. And I just wanna emphasize that um, two of these experiments are kind of combined. So the fence study and intercropping are kind of combined at the same study site. You'll see that clearer in a little bit. All right, speaking of the study site, the big study site, um, it is the Kasigao Wildlife Corridor of Southeast Kenya. So you can see in the top right of the figure um, where we're at, it's pretty close to the coast. And um, it's called a corridor because it is land that is in between two national parks. So up top, you have Savo East National Park, bottom left, you have Savo West. These are protected um, wildlife national parks. All these areas that are uh, boxed off in black, these are, uh, these are ranches that are owned partially by the community, partially by Wildlife Works, who I mentioned was a partner in this project. And so these are also for the most part wild habitat, but they are mixed use. So you can, they do allow grazing of livestock within these lands. The red area, is Rukinga Ranch, otherwise known as Rukinga Wildlife Sanctuary. And that is run by Wildlife Works and that is a pure wildlife sanctuary. There's no other activities that go on in there um, other than, you know, say tourism. And so my research took place, one experiment was within the wildlife sanctuary where I lived for seven months. And then the other experiment was right here along the border between the sanctuary and community land. So anything that's not boxed off here. Um, so like all this area is community land. But you can see how this the Kasaga Wildlife Corridor um, is valuable to allow wildlife to go back and forth between these two national parks. Okay, so the Zypit experiment. What are Zypits? Zypits are an ancestral indigenous climate smart agricultural technique. Essentially, all that means is that they've been around for a long time and farmers in this region have um, practiced this technique. And what does it involve? Well, if you look at the picture here in the bottom right, there's my little highlighter. I hope you can see my highlighter in the talk. Um, but these are the components. So what you do is you dig a pit. Um, tip, historically, if you're growing corn, it's about 50 to 60 centimeters deep. That's about two feet. You fill the bottom with vegetative material, and then you create an integrative mixture of topsoil and manure that you then fill back into the hole almost to the tippy top. You still want a little bit of an indent um, to allow for water to kind of trickle into the pit, allow for water retention. And so um, the reason why these work so well is that you're improving the nutrients in the soil, which is often very poor. And you're also allowing for um, these areas for water and rainfall to sit um, and improve the, the water availability to these plants. I'm not studying whether zypits are successful. There's lots of literature out there that shows you that they are. 
I am addressing another component of Zy pits, which is that they are very labor intensive. Um, as you can imagine, you're digging these pits um, by hand. There is very few um, machinery, farming machinery in Kenya. I think during my whole seven months in the study site, I saw like two tractors. Um, there's just not the resources or the money for that. And so most farmers, they either hand dig everything with a with um, a shovel or a hoe, which is called a djembe. That's primarily what they use if they're digging pits, um, or they'll use livestock to pull plows if they're tilling their field. So anyway, um, back to the labor. Digging this entire top left image by hand, there were three of us that were digging it. This is my study site. And I think there was 19 actual pits. And that took three of us four full mornings. So like four hours a morning for four mornings just to dig that little thing. You can imagine why farmers are not going to implement side pits on a large scale. If they haven't, you know, acres of fields, it would take them forever to dig these side pits, at least to, you know, the two foot depth. Now, albeit that labor hurdle is only an initial hurdle, because once you dig these side pits, they're then viable for multiple growing seasons where you don't have to redig. Um, sometimes as much as four growing seasons or two years, two full years that you can, you know, all you have to do is replant. And then when you do dig again, the soil should already be, um, the substrate should be a little bit looser, easier to dig. And all you have to do is really just add more manure and keep doing that. But it's really that initial hurdle that's keeping people from adopting this technique on a large scale. And so my research is addressing that problem and trying to assess what is more critical to Zypit's success. Is it the depth or is it the nutrients that you're adding to it? Because if you don't need to dig as deep, um, you only have to dig 20 centimeters instead of 50 or 60 centimeters, and it does just as well, then it's more likely that a farmer is going to want to adopt that practice. So going into some quick methods for the Zypit study, I have a table here on the right. This is the experimental design, um, which shows four different treatments. I'm going to group them into two different groups. So I first highlighted in orange, this is uh, my group that's looking at depth, and this is this the large field here, the large table. Um, if I can get my cursor to work. There we go. So that table there. And this is my original experiment. This is looking at your do your deep or traditional zypits vary. Uh, does the corn growth vary from that compared to shallow zypits, which are half that depth, or control plots, which is essentially just planting on the surface. I lightly, you know, tilled up the surface to plant, but that, that's all I did. And so that's looking at depth as my main um, factor. But then, thanks to the help of the amazing Earthwatch teams um, who came and helped with the measurements for the Zypit study, we were able to dig six new Zypits that for the second growing period, um, I was able to create a new treatment group. So over here, and I didn't elaborate. So DZ is deep Zy, SZ is shallow Zy, C is control. Um, they were randomly distributed throughout the field to account for variation. I'm not going to get into the stats of it, of why that's important. But um, this new field here is deep zy pits without manure. So it's that original technique, 50 centimeters deep, but we're just not adding any manure. We're just putting some vegetative material and mixing up the soil, and that's it. And so then I can make comparisons between those two lines in green to see, okay, is it the depth or is it the nutrients that are more important? Did this over two growing periods, and in each of those pits or plots, we put nine maize seeds. So two in each corner and one in the center. Why? That's just because that's what farmers in the region historically do. I don't want to venture away from what farmers um, have been doing for decades. And why maize? Um, it's a staple crop. Most, almost all farmers in Kenya that I've seen have corn or maize in one capacity or another, and that's because it's used to make one of the most popular and most eaten dishes in Kenya, which is ugali. Ugali is essentially um, maize meal that you boil to turn to like a polenta almost, polenta-like consistency. Um, and I, I swear Kenyans eat that for almost every single meal. So maize is a valuable part of um, the economy and also just what people eat. So this is the field. This is what it looks like with crops in it, just so you can see. And then this is the whole view. Um, the original field is here where my highlighter's at, and then this was the new one dug by Earthwatch teams. Um, you can see there is a house there. That is not my house, um, but this is at the research camp uh, that Wildlife Works operates. 
And so it's a fenced in facility. It's a lot more controlled environment for this experiment. I don't want to have a lot of outside variables coming in and making my life difficult. I want it to be as close to a laboratory setting as possible, as possible as you can get in the middle of the Kenyan bush. And this was that option. So going into data collection, I'm not going to harp on this too much um, just because otherwise I'll be talking for three hours. But um, I visited the fields twice per week. And I essentially collected data that allow me to um, look at growth over time, development over time, and then end values. By that, I mean like what's the end yield? What's the end root depth of these plants um, that I can then compare and say, okay, are the deep side pits any different than the shallow side pits, any different than the control plots in these measures? And you can see photos of some Earthwatch volunteers helping with measurements. Um, they were all amazing. Uh, measuring some roots here. On the right, this is the yield from one singular plot. And I did this for every plot. What I would do is I'd take all the corn, I would count all of the kernels, um, and then weigh, that, weigh a few of them. And then you can get the yield by, if you know the number of kernels and how much each kernel weighs, you can extrapolate. So going on to the other experiment, this is that combined one that I was talking about, which is looking at intercropping which is a climate smart ag technique and elephant deterrent fences, which uh, address human elephant conflict. There we go. So what is intercropping? A lot of you might be familiar with it. It's just mixed cropping. It's just having multiple crops within the same field. It's the opposite of a monocrop. And um, intercropping is considered climate smart agriculture because uh, it builds resilience to climate change, uh, primarily in regards to the soil. Most times when you're intercropping, you introduce some sort of legume species. Uh, by that, I mean things like beans, like peas. And so for those that don't know, legumes do a process called nitrogen fixation, which to summarize it very broadly, just means that they're able to take nitrogen in the soil that plants can't use and convert it to a form that can be used um, by a plant such as corn. And so um, that improves the nutrients in the soil and it also improves the structure. If you have these diverse root systems that are interwebs of different crops, it's more likely to withstand things like erosion. So for this study, we looked at three different crops, maize, cowpeas, and green grams that we, uh, we asked farmers at our study site to plant in alternating rows, as you can see in the bottom right. Cowpeas and green grams are both legumes. Green grams also go by the name mung beans, if you've ever heard of mung beans. But these are two crops that are commonly grown in the region. Farmers like to crop them, they want to crop them, and there's also a market for it. Again, I didn't want to introduce any new crops into the study. All right, so another component of this, like I said, it's two combined, so I hope I'm not confusing you, but is uh, talk about casaine fences, which are a fence that is used to address human elephant conflict. So I'm going to go through briefly the construction of this fence using some pictures um, of some Earthwatch volunteers constructing fences. And so it is made of these metal rolls called mimbati, and these are used for roofing primarily uh, in Kenyan households. And so you take those uh, metal sheets, which are, um, again, we're thinking about affordable here. It's comparatively a lot more affordable than like an electric fence or a concrete wall. Um, you take these, the metal, you cut it up into strips, you flatten out those strips and then cut them into smaller strips. You hammer some holes in them. You string them up on a fence line, um, which is, is binding wire, so pretty thick, durable wire. You put hang them in clusters, and so you got a measured distance between, and you separate those clusters um, by twisting the wire, by making a little crimp. And then there you go. That is your Casaine fence. It is named after Simon Casaine, who is uh, one of the incredible researchers at Wildlife Works in Kenya. And so on the top right, you can see it better. Um, this is a Casayene fence, which consists of two strands of these metal strips that are hanging in clusters. And so you might be asking, how does this deter elephants? Because I can tell you right now, if an elephant really wanted to, it could knock down that thing easily. It's not going to physically keep an elephant out of a farm. But what it does do is it um, kind of addresses three different sensory components of elephants, that being sound, sight, and touch. So let's start with sound. These metal strips cling together in the breeze. They make a pretty unpleasant sound. And so as elephants approach a field and they hear that, um, that's a sound that 
uh, I would assume they associate with people. Sounds like people, you know, banging on pots and pans, trying to keep them out of their farm. So that's a way that it could discourage them going on a site. So number two, uh, these metal strips are very shiny. Most elephants come at nightfall to uh, raid farmers' fields. And so the moonlight shining off of those metal strips does create a flashing effect that uh, elephants could assume is people flashing lights. So again, trying to um, simulate people being there without actually having people there. And then the third one is touch. So these metal strips are pretty sharp to the touch. Now, an elephant's skin is thick. I don't think it would do too much damage to them, but by touching up against the fence, you're still creating that loud noise, which can startle them. And regardless of how it works, it works. Past ESAC studies have shown that this was successful within our study site in a conventional agricultural system, meaning that we only planted maize but it was the most effective fence compared to things like the beehives and the chili peppers that I talked about earlier. The study site, as I've referred to a few times, so this is a border between a wildlife sanctuary and community farmland. And I love this aerial image because you can actually see it really clear. On the right side, this is the wildlife sanctuary. On the left side, this is the farmland. And so it's a pretty harsh border between the two of them. And wildlife can come straight in if they wanted to into this farmland. Along this five kilometer border, we have 32 fields broken up into four clusters or four blocks of eight fields each. Um, that's to account for locational effects. And out of those fields, half of them have the Casaine fence, half of them don't. All of the fields are intercropped with the same techniques. So really this is a, a pretty simple experimental design. It's all the same crop. Um, it's just looking to see is there variation in how that crop does over the fields and why. And is the fence effective in this climate smart system and why? Methods, again, I'm gonna fly through this a bit, but um, looking at the, the agriculture side of things, I would rank the crops in each field. Um, that's because I can't measure each individual ear of corn in you know acres of fields. So I would look at a field, which is 32 meters by 16 meters, and I would just visually assess what is it at based off of a system that I made. And you can see the numbers, I guess, for this presentation are arbitrary, but you have a two, three, four, and five. Those are the rankings I would use based off of their development. For the human elephant conflict side of things, remember all these fields are surrounded by a fence, and we had camera traps at all of those fields to assess what wildlife, hopefully elephants, but all wildlife are coming to the fields. And then we would also assess crop damage uh, anytime we'd see it. And so you can see photos of people doing the measurements there. And then this is looking at crop damage. So on the bottom left here, uh, anytime that there is a crop rating event, I would mark how many of each crop was um, trampled, how much was eaten. Um, if I can determine a species, that's what we want. So look at tracks. I can look at camera trap footage. So down here, these are goat tracks. Here, that's an elephant. Um, unfortunately, that's not my photo of an elephant. That's from past years, um, but that's what you would look for. And then elephant tracks up at the top right there. So kind of two studies, like I said, combined into one. Um, you can see the other measures that I took there. Really, it's just, it's about collecting as many variables as possible, collecting data on as many variables as possible to try to explain differences, whether that's differences in the crops, differences in how elephants come and interact with the fence. And really this, the question, the second one evolved into looking at all crop rating species because there just weren't that many elephants that came, which is good. I mean, it's great for farmers. You don't want elephants coming into the fields, not necessarily great for my data collection. And so I ultimately just ended up looking broadly at what's the composition of wildlife that enter these fields. Okay, I'm, I'm harping on this part of the question a little bit because I think it's really important. I was looking at variation between these fields that are intercropped. In a perfect world, you would think that they're all identical because they are all planted with the same seeds. We give farmers the same brand of seeds. They're all planted on the same day or within a day or two of each other. And they're all generally within the same location. So you would expect that they get the same weather conditions and rainfall. So I'm trying to answer why is there so much variation? These pictures here are two different fields, both taken at the same day. So um, you can see the hill in the distance for reference. So one is a little closer to the hill, but they're only about, I think, a kilometer and a half apart. And you can see that at week seven, one of them is doing incredible and one of them is doing very poor. And so my first question is why? And 
in my head, the first thing that comes to my mind is the soil. There's got to be differences in the soil, maybe. You can see on the left here that it's very sandy soil, um, whereas on the right, you can't see the soil, but I'll tell you that it's not as sandy. So I'm like, okay, that's the answer, right? Well, not necessarily. And there's other factors that play into it. Because if you look at seasonal variation, so now here, the image on the right, that's that same field. This is that same field during the first growing season. So now the soil's the same, theoretically. I mean, it might've changed a little bit between growing seasons, but for the most part, the soil substrate, the nutrients would be about the same. But in the second growing season, it did a lot better than the first. So then again, why? Um, my first thought would be rainfall. Maybe the second field got more rain, um, which it did in fact get more rain um, than the first growing season on the left. Maybe that's why at week seven, the one's doing a lot better than the other. Okay, but again, it's not that simple because look at this example. This is the same thing on the left. This is growing season one. On the right, this is growing season two. This example and that example are about a football field apart. They're not far apart at all. And in this one, the during the first growing season, the corn did incredible. It was the best field by far. And then just three, four months later, this is what it looked like. Um, whereas a field, you know, right down the way looked that good. And so um, to me, it's really interesting trying to figure out why this is the case. Because again, they're all the same seeds. They're all planted on the same day. And in this case, they're the same exact field. Um, and then you can even go even further with this, which I didn't do, but you can even look at within field variation. So this corn here on the right and this smaller, lighter green, it's both corn, um, both again, planted on the same date, with the same seeds. They're literally 30 centimeters apart from each other. Why is this one growing so well and that one's not? Really interesting. Um, I don't have all the answers for you, but I just think it's this is what science is about and about answering these questions. All right. Um, connecting this in to some, you know, extracurricular things. The Casa Yene fence, um, as I mentioned, we found that it's a very valuable um, deterrent, elephant deterrent, at least currently. And so um, it's important to educate the community about that. And so I participated in some outreach at a local primary school called Sasenyi Primary, which is right near the study site. And so um, on the left there, I designed some educational materials. And on the right, this was really cool. We had, with the help of Earthwatch teams, we made Casa Yine fences and we um, wrapped them around the school's garden. They have a school garden that they use for teaching purposes. Um, in the past, they've had elephants come in and do that. So it, it was an educational um, session or lecture, if you will, for these kids, but they were hands-on helping us put the fence up. Um, and it was just, it was a really cool opportunity. And it gets the word out. And here are just some more photos um, of the school. I just want to, you know, emphasize some other things real quick. Uh, ESAC has played a big role in the past few years, or since its inception, really, of helping with the school's lunch feeding program. Um, most of families in this region have one meal a day, and um, the, the school does not get much government support at all. And so there's days where they don't have any food in school either. So they go the whole school day without eating anything. And ESAC has helped a lot with um, raising funds to support the school. And so now they have, you know, at least a regular lunch supply. And then another initiative that we worked with on the right here, this is looking at um, a water tank at the school. And so we were able to fundraise money to connect that water tank to their kitchen. This is their kitchen, that third image there, um, where they, you know, make the food for the students. But the thing is that tanks all the way up on the hill and there's no connection to the water source. So these cooks had to walk all the way up the hill with the buckets, get the water, come back down just to cook a meal every day. And so we were able to connect the pipeline to the school. Um, by the way, most of these images, um, photo credit goes to Lindy Martinez from Earthwatch Team 4, um, including that image. So uh, the kids are just, I mean, they're incredible. I think all the Earthwatch volunteers can um, just emphasize how how much of an eye-opening experience it is to be there and just see how the education system differs and the conditions that they have. But they're all just um, so friendly and kind, um, as are all of the teachers. So yeah, I wanted to emphasize that. Now, if I look at my time, I've been talking for quite a while already. Um, I have not mentioned raptors once. So I'm going to tie this into raptors now, because after all, this is a Hawk Mountain talk. Before I do that, you're going to have to bear with me because I got to go back to elephants for a second. Elephants are ecosystem engineers. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at what elephants do. Elephants, they eat a lot. The average adult elephant eats 
over 300 pounds of food every single day. Um, again, that's just one elephant every single day, 300 pounds of food. That's a lot of vegetation um, that is then influencing the vegetative communities and the habitat. What happens if you eat a lot? Well, you poop a lot. And elephants poop a lot and they're not very good digesters. And so um, their poop is typically very rich in nutrients that then go back into the soil and help new plant life grow. So that's kind of creating habitat. Elephants also knock down trees. They can strip bark off of trees, break off branches. There's a lot of reasons why they do that. Um, one of them could be they knock down trees to get the vegetation at the top of the tree. Um, another one could be males when they are in what's called must. Um, they are you know, raging with testosterone and they just knock down trees to knock down trees. And so that creates habitat. That also destroys habitat too. And so this is all branched under elephant habitat modification, which as I mentioned, it can um, affect vegetation density, create habitat, destroy habitat, et cetera. So again, I'm getting into how this matters for raptors, but um, just want to emphasize that everything is interconnected. So um, a change that you make within a system, well, whether that be, let's just say an elephant deterrent fence, could have unintended consequences, um, which we could also describe as cascading effects um, that you would never imagine. So let's go through a hypothetical situation here. Uh, let's say these elephant deterrents are successful and they're used on a wide scale throughout the communities and elephants avoid community land. That's great, right? Well, if elephants are avoiding community land, that means that they might be spending more time or they probably will be spending more time in the wild habitat, which means if they're typically going into farms to supplement the, their diet, well, now they're eating more vegetation and they could be modifying that habitat more than normal, knocking down more trees, breaking more branches, et cetera. Raptors then could potentially have less habitat to perch or to hunt or to nest. Or if elephants are eating more, you know, lower vegetation, that could influence the prey that those raptors eat. And so ultimately, this could impact raptor populations. And I know it seems a little far-fetched, but there's a lot of examples of stuff like this happening um, throughout the world. And I added onto the list there. I even tied it back to farmers and how good things for farmers can make it bad for farmers. So take a look at that. But um, essentially just showing that this is why it's important to monitor things like habitat and wildlife populations after making a change. Even if you think it's unrelated, like climate smart agriculture, it could impact raptors. And why raptors? Why the emphasis on them? Well, here are the 10 most common species that I would see in the wildlife sanctuary. Um, again, these are the most common ones. Uh, take them all in for a second. They're really cool. Photo credit for most of these goes to Dakota Bacaro, who was the student before me in the ESAC program. Um, the Marshall Eagle here, this is the largest eagle in Kenya, the Batalore, look at the coloration on the face. Secretary bird is, I'd say, arguably my favorite bird. Um, not only are they really cool looking, but they also um, eat snakes and they do that by stomping on snakes. So they're just really cool animals. And then the vultures down here. I love me some vultures. And I know Bracken Brown, if he is on this talk, agrees. Uh, these are all, I mean, I think vultures get a bad rap for how they look. I think they look really cool. I mean, look at the purple and the pink here and the lappet face vulture. Um, they're just really wild looking raptors and they play a pivotal role, I mean, in ecosystem function. So anyway, these are the most common raptors that you'd see within the sanctuary. Now I'm going to pull up their IUCN conservation status. So yeah, these are, again, are the 10 most common ones that I would see in the sanctuary. One is vulnerable, four are endangered, two are critically endangered. Um, that's big. And the vultures in particular, most of the, we call them the old world vulture species are, you know, um, in dire situations, primarily due to poisoning, um, which I'm not going to, you know, emphasize in this talk because I don't have the time, but you can always talk to Bracken at Hawk Mountain and he would be glad to talk about that. Um, so anyway, this is why it's important to monitor these species, um, these raptor species. Um, you want to know whether any actions you take could have unintended consequences that affect them, and they already have small populations and declining population numbers. Um, in Kenya, I just want to note that we call them high conservation value species. And then another component, elephants are also endangered. So, so one endangered species could be negatively affecting another endangered species. How do you protect both? This is where it gets really complex. And I wanted to add this quote because it does apply. This is from Hawk Mountain's founder, Rosalie Edge. The time to protect a species is while it is still common. And I think this is really valuable to my message because even though, yes, there are those endangered and critically endangered species, 
really you want to monitor as much as you can, even species that aren't vulnerable, um, because they still play a pivotal role. And you want to protect them while they're still abundant, not while they're already um, you know, in peril. So how do you monitor raptors? Well, you do that through wildlife transects. And so there are six wildlife transects that ESAC has throughout the wildlife sanctuary. You can see them here. Each is between 10 and 15 kilometers. And so um, what you do is you drive along that transect. And anytime you spot an animal, you mark what it is, the number of it, what species it is, demographic info, habitat, GPS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's how you do that. And then remember, we're comparing this to elephant habitat. So um, you want to monitor raptor populations, but you also want to see if elephant habitat modification is changing. That's what EHM stands for, elephant habitat modification. And so this was a big part of Dakota's research, who was the student before me. Um, not a big part. This was her research for her master's. And so she had these vegetation plots throughout the sanctuary where she just assessed damage by elephants that you could then correlate to the raptor population that, uh, estimates that you get through transects. So preliminary results. Um, you guys caught me at a good time where I'm in the middle of data analysis, so I don't have all the answers for you, but I can give you some. Zypets, briefly, and I'll be brief with a lot of these. So um, manure seems to be a lot more important than depth. That's what I would expect, honestly. If you look at this graph on the right, and let me find my cursor. If you look at this on the right, the blue and the green lines, this is looking at height over time, by the way, should have mentioned that. This is looking at maize growth over time. And you can see that deep side pits, which are blue, and shallow side pits, which are green, um, really do not have much difference in how they grow. Whereas down here, the red and orange, those are the control plots. Remember, just planted on the surface, no nutrients added to them. The purple here, these are the zy pits that are deep but have no manure. They're essentially no different than the control plots. That shows that it's almost entirely the nutrients that are playing a role and not how far you deep, not how far you dig, how deep you dig. And that's big. That means that farmers don't have to dig two feet down just to get a good crop. You can go 20 centimeters down and maybe you can have more zy pits on your land than you previously had. Here on the left, it shows the same thing essentially, but this is looking at yields. Blue and green are deep and shallow side pits. They're clustered together. Um, they had higher yields than the control in the deep without manure. And this is showing the same thing. So deep side pits, uh, this is yields. So this was from one singular side pit. That's the corn that we got. This isn't your Iowa corn. You're not gonna have these massive ears, but that's pretty good for Kenya standards. And then on the right was from a control plot. Note that that piece of paper is the same size in both images. So you can really see the difference in just how much corn you get. And then on the right, that's looking at the roots. So on the left, that's a root system from a zy pit, a deep or a shallow zy pit. And on the right, that's from the control. So you can see even on the roots made a difference. Intercropping and human elephant conflict. So um, this is looking at that other study. Livestock were by far the most common crop rating species, which um, I didn't anticipate going into it, but it does make a lot of sense considering most of these farmers have livestock. Out of 186 events of crop rating during that first season, 74% of them were goats that came into the, the fields. And most of these goats were the goats that were owned by the farmers who farmed the fields. Uh, the reason for that, uh, I think, is that most of these livestock are watched by their kids. And by watched, I mean they're not watching their, their livestock, and so they get loose and they go into the fields. Um, there were some other crop rating species too. You can see the percentages there as far as the ones that are most common. In the image in the bottom left, you have a diker, which is an antelope, same with the eland here on the right, but they were at lower percentages of uh, frequency. But now if you look away from just the numbers and look at the severity, what percentage of a crop rating event is a severe event, which I put as more than 30 plants eaten, that's where elephants come in. So during that first season, there were only three crop rating events by elephant, but two of them were really high severity, affected a lot of fields, a lot of crop was damaged. And so um, I'm interested in kind of running these analyses and seeing what has a bigger impact, the goats that crop rate a lot, but their damage is relatively small, or elephants that crop rate um, not a lot, but their damage is huge. So don't have that for you yet, but some interesting findings. Soil comparisons are to be determined, but it does seem promising that um, 
Soil could be the reason why we have variation between all of those fields in the study site. And as I mentioned, there are very few crop rating events, less than 10. Again, good for farmers, not necessarily good for my data. And so I had a fairly small sample size. And um, because of that, I'm still working on the numbers for that. The fence seemed less effective, but when you have that few event, events, it's hard to really make conclusions. So raptors now, I know I'm getting close on my time, but I only have a couple more slides here talking about raptors, if you guys don't mind. But I know this will be recorded and you can always check on YouTube if you're running short on time. Um, transect counts for raptors. So at the request of Bracken Brown, I included some of my own photos of raptors. I made them small so you couldn't see how bad the quality is, but <laughs> these are some of my photos. Um, and these are the results from transects. Uh, looking at those 10 most common species that I listed previously. Again, the red are endangered, the dark red are critically endangered. And this is the number of individuals that I saw over 78 transects. It's hard to know what that means unless you compare it to something, right? And so this is looking at ESAC data from 2017 to 2022. This is total number of individuals, not total number of sightings. This is the number of individuals we saw. And you can't compare this fully because uh, we didn't do the same number of transects each year. So that's a component. We also didn't do any transects in 2020. But if you just broadly look at the numbers, you can see that they're, like if you were to multiply by five, most of them in 2023 um, in multiplied by five would be higher than what we've seen in the past. So it was a pretty good year for counts. Uh, and then you can also look at patterns of the order of species, which species are most common. You can see that the pattern's pretty similar. Comparing left and right, there's not much difference in the order of species that we saw. I do want to emphasize that the unknown vultures here um, are primarily because I cannot distinguish between white-backed and Rupel's griffins. They are very similar, especially from far away. And I am not Bracken Brown who could identify anything from three miles away. So um, I would list them as unknown vultures. So these numbers can be broken up into those two categories. And so they're probably higher than what I listed there. Um, but yeah, those are the patterns. And then looking at the habitat side of things, this is from directly from Dakota's thesis. And she stated that elephant habitat modification had no observable negative impacts on species richness and diversity for most medium to large mammal, raptor, and large ground bird species. Essentially what that means is that all of that damage in the habitat didn't have a direct effect on the numbers that we saw on these transects, which is good, right? I mean, you don't wanna see these populations declining. And this is why we monitor. Um, we monitor because um, we want to see if we have any impact. And no impact is still results, and in this case, good results, because we don't want uh, any species richness or abundance diversity to decline. Um, ele elephant habitat modification did impact community assemblage. What that point essentially means is that the species that you would find together in a habitat were slightly different depending on it. Um, but overall, um, this was good stuff. This is why we monitor. And it'll be interesting to see, especially as climate smart agriculture becomes more widespread, as elephant deterrent fences become more widespread, it'll be interesting to see if these numbers differ because this is a, you know, a relatively small study site. Oh. I'm emphasizing a few things too. This is a horrible photo, but I'm proud of it because this was the first white-headed vulture that ESAC has spotted in like five years and I spotted it and managed to get a photo of it. So I'm really proud of that, um, which we added to our database. And then I have to add owls in there because I haven't mentioned them and this is a Hawk Mountain talk. And so um, I did not record any data on them because we do all of our transects during the day, either right after sunrise or right before sunset. But Wildlife Works does do their own transects at night. And so this is a, oh, I believe it's a spotted eagle owl um, that we saw. So I had to include that. And then just for fun, I love these guys. These are lappet face vultures. And I know this photo isn't the best quality, but I just really liked it. Uh, I mean, look at these guys. Look at the, the fuzzy legs, that look of determination on its face. Um, these vultures are so massive, their wingspan is so big that they can't just take off. They can't just flap their wings and go. They literally have to run down a runway and flap in order to take off. So I got this guy mid-flap, <laughs> mid-takeoff, if you will. Um, so there you go, Bracken. Those are some of my, my photos. And now takeaways. What are the main points of all this? Well, everything is interconnected, if you haven't figured that out at this point. 
Um, decisions that you make as a wildlife manager or as a farmer in one area could have some unintended consequences. Climate smart agriculture is promising, but you have to look at the socioeconomic, sociocultural and economic factors. Um, so for example, is there a market for a crop? You could have a crop or a technique that does really well, but if it's not going to sell, a farmer's not gonna wanna do that because it's not affecting their livelihoods. Um, likewise, is it what farmers want to crop? Culturally, a lot of these farmers have been growing corn for decades, generations. And so um, to change that is, is a big change. And even if they see evidence that, wow, that crop, that technique's doing really well, if they don't wanna do it, um, or it doesn't align with their values of who they are as a farmer, they're not gonna wanna do it. So you need to take that into account. Human wildlife conflict is always evolving. Um, and I'm bringing this in to talk about elephants, which are incredibly smart, so incredibly smart. And so um, I predict that, I don't know over what time span, but within maybe a year, two years, five years, elephants are gonna habituate to the Kasaine fence. I think it's a matter of time um, just because they're smart. They learn, they figure these things out. And so this conflict, it's not that we just have a solution and we walk away. We're gonna constantly have to keep changing things um, to address that conflict, which I think makes it all the more special and interesting um, a topic to study. And then finally, climate change will continue to threaten ecosystems and agricultural communities. Um, that's a given. I mean, climate change has really hit these Kenyan agricultural communities hard. Um, not just getting, you know, having food to sell, but also just food for them to, you know, survive. And so that's why it's so important to study solutions to the, the climate crisis. I want to give a special thanks to a lot of people. Um, first and foremost, my advisor, Dr. Bruce Schulte, for all of his guidance. Uh, Simon Casaine and Bernard Amakobe, they are the two heroes who helped me with Earthwatch teams. They are research scientists for Earthwatch, and they're both incredible and highly intelligent. They know so much more than I would ever, will ever know. All the Earthwatch volunteers for their help, they really made the, my project and my thesis go a lot further than it could have gone. My rangers, Bromwell and Kelvin, they were literally with me every step of the way. Anytime I was in the sanctuary, they were with me. So they, they helped collect a lot of data. The Sasenyi farmers, that's the village. So the, the village farmers and their families just for welcoming in ESAC in these past um, six years and hopefully uh, in the future. Uh, the community monitors who helped me collect some data as well. The Kivuli Camp and Research Camp staff, they housed me, Kivuli Camp did, and they, they really welcomed me in as part of their family. And so I have some forever friends there. Wildlife Works, so the company just for allowing me to uh, live within their wildlife sanctuary and work with their research scientists. And then of course, Earthwatch and Western Kentucky University for funding. So. I apologize for going slightly over. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have any questions, now's the time. Matt, thank you so much. That was fascinating. So impressive. I learned so much. Um, you definitely have some kudos and compliments in the Q&A saying great, great um, presentation and what a fantastic research project. One question that we have um, is what are your plans next? What's next for you? Ooh, that is the dreaded question, isn't it? Um, so uh, I'm not entirely sure yet. I do have a direction I want to go. I'm really passionate about research and I'm really passionate about teaching and outreach and education, um, personally due to my experiences at Hawk Mountain, give that shout out. But um, so I want to find a career that allows me to do both of those things, hopefully together. A lot of people just assume, well, okay, you'll go into the professor track and go into academia. I don't know if that's necessarily what I want to do. I'm very much open to um, going into a PhD next. Um, but I just want to, well, first, I, I want to take a little break after my master's. I won't go straight into a PhD, but I'll be looking for opportunities um, anywhere in the world. I'm open for anything, any species that allow me to um, research things I'm passionate about, like human wildlife conflict, and be able to contribute to, you know, education, because science means nothing unless it gets out to the people. That's really what matters. Yes, agreed. Um, love it. And I have to say all these we're having all these comments come in the Q and A, and it's just kudos, lots of compliments. Fabulous work, my Rafiki <laughs> <laughs> from Graham. From Graham, yeah, and that's, that's Jennifer, a watch volunteer. <laughs> uh, when are you coming to speak to my classes? Um, so lots of compliments. We can have another. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can have another question. Do you have any suggestions for anything the ordinary person can do? 
to contribute to human wildlife conflict mitigation? What can we do here in the United States to help with this? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and I think there's a lot of answers to that question. As far as um, if we're talking about here in the United States, connecting to other places where there's human wildlife conflict, um, I mean, a big thing is just supporting, whether it's conservation organizations or um, other entities that try to um, address the conflict and have solutions to it. Um, I think really, I mean, the biggest thing that we can do from here is just talk about it. I told this to the Earthwatch volunteers all the time. I mean, you might not be able to have a direct impact to try to resolve human wildlife conflict, but if you can get the word out and really spread that web of knowledge, then maybe you can finally reach someone who can make an impact, whether that's financial or scientifically or otherwise. And so, um, yeah, feel free to talk about these things with, I mean, your friends, your family, like force them to listen to you about these issues because they are really serious issues. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Another question. How much access do the farmers have to manure to use in Zy pits? Do they all have livestock of some sort? That's another really good question, which I would have hit if I had more time. So um, most farmers, at least where I was at, do have livestock. I'd say it's probably like 75% um, of them have livestock. And so um, most of them do have access to manure that they could at least use um, in a smaller setting for Zy pits, because I bring, I, I get your question about like, if we see that nutrients are what matters, then how much, you know, how much supply of that do you actually have? Um, and I think uh, to kind of segue from that a little bit, I think uh, an interesting part, and I haven't analyzed this yet, is that um, the fields where there was the most goats crop rating, for example, um, there's also a lot of goat scat in those fields. And I wonder if there's like a thing where it's like, at what point do goats coming in, are they more beneficial than harmful because they have the manure that they're adding to the field, but then they're also eating the crops. Um, so I think it's very possible for, you know, at least in most communities to have manure that they can, um, if they don't have livestock, they can get from their neighbors. A lot of these communities are tight knit. In fact, the manure that I got, I got from some of the farmers at the community because um, they had excess. So they probably can't spread it over all their fields over acres, but if they're doing a smaller, a smaller set of you know techniques, I think it's possible. Wonderful, thank you so much. And again, a lot more comments coming in the Q and A, just complimenting you. Um, and I have to say, Matt, you know, you're a man of many talents. And a little bird told me that you're also a very talented drummer. And um, I heard that you were part of a hit single that was produced at Hawk Mountain in the spring of 2022 called "The Counter." Oh, absolutely. So, I'm wondering, did you get to do any drumming when you were in Kenya? <laughs> oh, did I? Um, I did go to, when I was in Nairobi, I went to, they did some, you know, like cultural tribal dances and drumming in that, which I participated in. But I am very much not a drummer. Um, you're more <laughs> of a drummer than I am because you were also a part of that band um, <laughs> where we did that song. That, that was a fun time as a trainee. And credit to Diego for um, creating that song. Definitely. Uh, well, thank you so much. Oh, I think I might have seen another question come in. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Or maybe they're they're all comments. No questions. Okay, there were so many. It took me a while to read them all. But um, Matt, thank you again so much. You are so passionate. What a great project, uh, important, meaningful work. And thank you for taking the time to share it with us. It was incredible. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us this evening. It means the world to us. Um, and as always, before closing off, I want to invite everyone to come to Hawk Mountain and let you know what um, exciting things we have going on at the mountain in February. So we are in the heart of our Winter Artisan Series at Hawk Mountain. This is what's going on with our Winter Artisan Series where we connect with local artists and you can support the sanctuary and raptor conservation while learning a new art skill. This Saturday, we have uh, painting with coffee. And next Saturday, the 3rd of March, we have the art of trees. And then Saturday, March 9th, we have an acrylic painting workshop, workshop called Mountain with a Checkered Pass. This Sunday at the mountain, we have yoga on the mountain. And then March 2nd, we have an owl prowl. And March 5th, we have breakfast with the birds. So we hope to see you soon. And thank you again so much for all of your support. And Matt, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's it, everyone. Bye for now.